Well, my name is Darren, and uh, it's just been great to sing to the Lord together, and we'll continue after some time opening the Scriptures to sing again. And as you know, we're in this series in the Gospel of John called Believe, and just before we jump in, I just wanted to share a quick report. We had VBS last week, by the way, which was fantastic. Yes, we can thank God for that. And we're going to hear a report on VBS next week, but need to get the pictures and all that ready to roll. So let me just give you a quick report on our Grace Village Workday from yesterday. By God's grace, we just had a great day. Group of maybe 15 or 16 people from 8 a.m. to uh, close to 6 p.m. In fact, the city team contractor was ready to go home, but uh, our team was still working away. So you can see... Uh, members of our team there. We had just lots of people. We had a lot of teenagers too. We had Caius and Christopher, and and uh, we had we had Faith Illumifin, who was just up on a ladder operating complex tools of which I am ignorant, but it was good to see her uh, using them. And anyway, we just had a great day. Kelly and Zach brought us delicious tacos because we know a ministry army marches on its stomach, right? So we had a delicious lunch. Anyway, uh, just wanted you to see that, and this project's ongoing. And uh, so if you want to be in on what's going on, just reach out to me, and I'll put you on the list. Okay, Um, let me share a little bit about this woman. Her name is Emily Flake. She is a writer and a cartoonist, and what she writes I have found to be uh, very moving and, and honestly spot on with some of her observations about life and, and people and so on. Uh, in fact, I, I corresponded with her a couple years ago when something that she drew and wrote kind of touched me, and that started a correspondence, and she sent me something. She drew something, sent it as a gift. I was so surprised to open it up. And if you want to see what it is, come by my office sometime, and I'll, and I'll show you, and I'll tell you the story. But anyway, um, she wrote uh, a humor piece that was published not that long ago, and it's called Stalking a Rustically Hip Family on Instagram. And this perfectly illustrates and and introduces our topic for this morning. So let me share a little bit of this with you. And if you're not on social media, I know you will still get it. The woman in the photograph looks out at me with a face full of exhaustion and bliss In her hands, she cradles the purplish bundle of a just-born child. It's a beautiful, celebratory image of human existence, as raw and pure and joyful as anything seen through the orderly square of an Instagram post can be. I peer at it in the dark and hiss whisper, how dare you? There are so many ways to be a creep these days. One of the easier ways is to follow people on social media toward whom you have feelings that are other than warm. That may sound like a long-winded description of a hate follow, but hate is a bit much, description-wise, for what I'm feeling. The woman with an arm full of newborn baby isn't exactly worthy of hatred. She and her husband are young and good-looking. Their days seem idyllic, full of chickens and art. I feel bad every time I look at them. When practicing this kind of social media creepiness, you find yourself feeling small in two ways. You understand yourself as less than, living a life that is not nearly as fun, interesting, or worthwhile as the account you follow, and you also sense that you are a petty person, swiping the screen while huffing fumes of self-righteous antipathy. Let me read this last little part. We're better to get a high on your own internal toxicity than Instagram? Wait, I can answer that question. Twitter, obviously. But Instagram has better visuals. On Instagram, my capacity for envy is boundless. Well, what is envy? Envy is an intense sadness over someone else's achievements or attributes or successes and a strong desire to possess what they have. And we're going to see it in, in today's story. Our, our, our word in English, envy, is from the Latin, and it's a combo word meaning uh, in, meaning like against, and video meaning looking at. So it's ill looking. 
ill will towards somebody else. And as, as funny as, as Emily's piece is, you know, envy isn't really something to laugh at, at least for very long. And as, as faithers, we talked about last week how we are, that's our identity, people not expressing faith as a noun only, a body of belief, but also an ongoing active relationship with Jesus. It's faith in, in the New Testament is, is in John, it's always a verb. That we, as we follow our Lord Jesus and we're involved in this relationship with him, we should do an envy inventory now and then. Because our teacher and shepherd and Messiah, Jesus, said that envy drags us through the spiritual mud and it stains us from, from the inside. It's a, a cardiac emission, pardon the pun, that really pollutes ourselves and, and for those who are around us. In Mark 7, 21, our Lord teaches, for from within, out of the hearts of people come the evil thoughts, acts of sexual immorality, thefts, murders, acts of adultery, deeds of greed, wickedness, deceit, indecent behavior, envy listed with all these, slander, pride, and foolishness. And what our Lord has said in verse 20 is that these things defile us. And defile in kind of the religious sphere of things means contaminate. But really, it's a verb in Greek that just means to make something common and ordinary. And so what envy does is it takes people who are called to be uncommon and, and useful to our master and makes us less than that makes us just like everybody else in the world, not useful to our master. And we find ourselves living at a low ebb rather than a high plane. And we've found that we've, we've really departed from the path of Jesus. And like all sins, envy injures both the envier and the envied. Listen to this verse, Proverbs 14, 30. A tranquil heart. So this is a heart that's not boiling and seething with desire for what others have or what others are. A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. And bones is the Bible's way of talking about the whole person. So there's this malignant, malignant impact that envy, that it infects the whole self. The envier is spiritually, emotionally, and even physically compromised. And of course, envied people themselves are at risk. Proverbs 27, 4, wrath is cruel, anger is overwhelming, but who can stand before it? Jealousy. And in Hebrew, jealousy and, and envy are the, the same word, just translated differently in English there. Well, the envied person can be ostracized or gossiped about, or even in extreme cases, you see this in the Fox Newses and the CNNs all the time in the crime reports, victims of attack. But conversely, when we're celebrating others from the heart and we're learning to be truly happy for what others have or have accomplished, it's life to the flesh. And I just learned this this week in my study that the word flesh here is in the plural. It's literally life to the fleshes, which is the Bible's emphatic way of talking about, again, your entire self from body to soul, learning to celebrate others and rising above corrosive envy furthers whole person health and well-being. Well, we also know that following Jesus will mean forsaking envy, leaving it behind on, on the path of eternal life. And 1 Peter 2.1 says this, Therefore, get rid of all envy. And one of my childhood pastors, Pastor Rene Schlepfer at, at Twin Lakes Church in Santa Cruz, used to always read imperatives in the Bible like this, like get rid of this. Or, and he'd say, YBH, yes, but how? How do I do that? Well, we'll talk a little bit about our practical method as we go along. But let's get into the story for now. This is the setting for an envy trap that John the Baptist will sidestep. This is John 3, 22 through 24. After this... Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim, 
because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. And so the scene, Jesus has been talking with Nicodemus. We've talked about that the last couple of weeks. But now in this scene, some time has passed. He's outside the city, and what is he doing? He's baptizing with his disciples. And apparently, he has joined up with John the Baptist's ministry of baptism. And we know that Jesus' mission will be to baptize with the Holy Spirit. That hasn't started yet because John says that Jesus' hour hasn't come. He's going to the cross, he's dying, he's being raised, and is breathing out his spirit. That hasn't happened yet. So Jesus has joined with John's ministry of baptism, which is an amazing thing. And we see these two groups, John's disciples and Jesus' disciples, are baptizing, and something happens. Verse 25, now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing. And catch this, all are going to him. Oh, you see the envy trap right there in the middle of the path. They're saying, yeah, John, Boss, that guy that you had previously testified about, look, he's baptizing more, and people are flocking to him. He's trending up, and you know what that means? That we're losing influence. Well, this brings us to a, another ancient idea that, that John's gospel is going to take down, and this is the ancient and modern idea of limited good. And here's this idea. It's that uh, most people would think this in antiquity, and of course we see this today, that all the goods that are available are limited in quantity and are already distributed. There's only so much land, gold, fame, or praise existing in the world. So, if you see someone who seems to be gaining in any of these, inevitably you are losing, or your clan, or people you know, because the world is a zero-sum game. So for some to expand, others must contract. And there are many examples of this in the ancient world. These uh, stories about rivalries between philosophers and, and performer poets and statesmen. Even like Josephus, who wrote this about a rival named John, son of Levi. He said, believing that my success involved his own ruin. Right there, zero-sum game. He, meaning John, son of Levi, gave way to immoderate envy, hoping to check my good fortune by inspiring hatred of me and those under my command. He tried to induce the inhabitants of the three chief cities of Galilee to abandon their allegiance to me and go over to him. And we could give lots more examples in, in ancient and modern days of this toxic, deceptive idea of limited good. And we're going to see rivalries in this limited good outlook, even among Christian workers in the New Testament. But John the Baptist, rather than stepping over the threshold into envy and, and falling into this trap, no, he sidesteps it. And in fact, he actually steps above it to a higher plane, and he will provide his disciples and modern disciples like us with this amazing, health-giving wisdom. Listen to this passage, John 3, 27 through 30. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Wow. Let's just go back through this, and, and I'm going to paraphrase each one of these envy crushers, and we'll, we'll have a comment on each one. The first one is this. You can't compel God to give you more or make you different. In our Heavenly Father's generosity and wisdom, He has already given each one of us fearful and wonderful personhood. 
Psalm 139, 14, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, God made you to elicit reactions of astonishment and awe. That's literally what fearfully means. It means awe-inspiring. And I know that embarrasses us to, to read this, but this is what God's Word says. And even more surprisingly, that word, fearfully, is used of God himself in Psalm 68, 35, but just translated a little differently. Awesome is God from his sanctuary. You are a unique, irreplaceable human being on every dimension of created existence. No one looks like you, feels like you, thinks like you, can do what you were made to do. No other redeemed person can carry out the unique mission that, that God has carried or called you to carry out. And, and despite this, this truth, we all still want to rip more out of God's hands in terms of gifts or abilities or, or whatever. And this reminds me of an old story. I, I grew up in, in the 70s, and uh, my great uncle Jerry was a real gregarious, uh, loving guy, and, and I, I loved him. And, and he, uh, he would often give me and, and my cousins a big stack of quarters for the video arcade that was near our house. But he always did it in the context of a game. So I remember my uncle Jerry, he'd have a cigarette in one hand and have a big stack of quarters in the other. And all the cousins would have to get the quarters by peeling his beefy fingers back from his hand to get the quarters. And he thought this was just the funniest thing in the world, all these little kids trying to peel his fingers back. And of course, we couldn't do it. And after Uncle Jerry had a big laugh, he would open his hand and just shower us with, with the quarters. And I just think about how God has given each one of us quarters, you know, gifts and abilities and capacities. In fact, each one of us, each one of us here is herself or himself a custom coin that, that God himself designed and minted just once that bears his image and has unique etchings upon it that are like nobody else's. And rather than being content in that, like me with my Uncle Jerry, we try to rip his fingers apart and say, I want more or I want to be somebody different than I am. And honestly, it's an insult to the one who made the coin. Second, envy crushing wisdom from John is this here. Um, I told you, I'm not the guy. John makes this clear over and over again. This has been his, the drumbeat in the Gospel of John. Six verses into the Gospel of John, John the Baptist's identity and role is established. I didn't put this on the screen, but John 1.6 says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness. That's his role and identity, to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. And John himself says that in verse 15. He says, he who comes after me ranks before me. And I really like this here. Uh, right in the beginning of the story, leaders from Jerusalem send investigators to John. And they say, who are you? And he says right from the get-go, I'm not the Christ, even though they didn't ask him that. But he wants to get that out of the way and then he goes on and he says this, and they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Isn't that amazing, these two questions? Who are you? And what do you say about yourself? These are questions that everybody around us is trying to answer and struggling and drowning to try to do so. And John the Baptist gives us this amazing wisdom in verse 23. He says this, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Notice this, John defines himself only in reference to Jesus. 
That's the only way he defines himself. You know, independent identities are so easily injured. They make us compare ourselves with others. It only makes sense if you're a faither involved in an ongoing active relationship with Jesus to define yourself in relation to Jesus because that's what you have, organic connection with him. It would be like a branch failing to mention the vine it is attached to. And so when we define ourselves, we should always define ourselves in relation to him, just like John did, saying, I'm a a servant of the Lord, or, or I'm an encourager for the Lord. You may have a sense of a single word that gets at what it is he's called you to be or do in his kingdom, and maybe you base your identity on that, and nothing professionally, educationally, whatever. Here's another envy crusher. He says, I'm the best man. I'm not the groom. And he makes it clear that his role is the modern equivalent of best man. And and just like in our our culture, but even more in ancient Judaism, uh, that the best man was a highly honored position. And your job was to facilitate the union between bridegroom and bride, arrange the wedding, make sure everything goes off smoothly. But I think what we want to do is we secretly all want to be the groom. We want to be the focal point, the star of an ancient wedding. We just have this desire to draw the bride's attention away from the true groom and to draw it towards us. And I just have to share a little illustration of this groom impersonation syndrome. When I was 17, like I've said many times, I worked at at Camp Hammer. It was right after I graduated from high school. And uh, I'll just say it this way, from day one when I stepped onto the the grounds of Camp Hammer, I I was popular, to say the least. The the students really liked me, these little fourth, fifth, and sixth grade kids. And and I couldn't even really leave my cabin without my own kids and some of the other cabins, these boys just kind of hovering around me. And I have to tell you, it felt good. And just to give you a little picture of this, this is back in the 80s, and I, I found a picture of this online. This is called Friendship Pins. And what the kids would do back in the late 80s and the 90s, and I had eight years of this when I was at Camp Hammer, is the kids would go to the crap shack, and they would take a safety pin, and they would string their pin with tiny little beads, and they would give you that pin as a little token of their affection and their friendship. And I used to wear these Stan Smith Adidas tennis shoes as white as John Max, and over the course of the summer, (laughs) my shoelaces were loaded with these pins. I mean, I could barely walk around for the weight of these pins from all of my admirers. I have to admit, it felt good. There's nothing like being the object of so much attention and, 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 and love from these kids and so on. Well, I had eight years of that, and not only did I get recognition and affection from the kids, but I got it from my colleagues in the camp. I, I got it from my boss who just thought that I was great and so on. Well, after eight summers, I ended up going to law school, and in law school was a very different experience. I did not have law professors handing me academic friendship pins, like, wow, you're the next great uh, attorney. No, that didn't happen. My leather shoes were devoid of all pins, all right? And so I started to think, wow, you know what? I know the law is not for me. I'm going to go back into ministry. That's where I succeed. That's where I am loved. That's where I... And so I, I ended up finishing law school, and I got my first job at, at Santa Cruz Bible Church. And I just expected, again, the same flood of affirmation and approval to come my way. The only problem is it didn't. Everything was different. I, and to quote Death of a Salesman, you know, Willie Loman and, and, and uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman, I was liked, but I wasn't well-liked anymore. No, it was all different. It was like the magic was gone. And I didn't know how to get it back. I thought I'm the same person, same personality, but the kids, wow, it just was like, you're just the youth director. We don't have any particular devotion to you. And I didn't know how to deal with this. And I thought, I, I, I just, and so... Um, And not only that, but even my supervisors, unlike Kurt, but some of the others just thought I was an okay performer. And I was used to being thought of as a great performer. In fact, my office was right next to this guy's office, Dan Kimball. He was the high school pastor. I was the junior high pastor. And he was everything I wanted to be. He was cool. He was on the front end of everything in ministry. He was starting to write books. Everybody was paying attention to him. Everybody thought he was great. And he is a wonderful guy. 
and he couldn't have treated me better. But I was floundering, and somewhere along the lines, God just hit me over the head, and he made it clear that this isn't about you, that this is about a work I want to do in the middle school group, but through you, but it's not about you. And so I just started to take my eyes off myself and started to look at the people around me. What I saw was this unbelievable assembly of excellent potential middle school ministry workers. And I started to just reach out to different people and take people to coffee. And then God brought us Todd Slag, this 20-something guy who just had the X factor with students that I no longer had. And he brought Jeff Bish, this kind of low-key skateboard guy, originally from Nepal. Kids loved him. Brought Melissa Kenny, this young woman that the girls really identified with. And he brought us Chip Handley, this Seagate engineer who loved skateboards and built a skateboard ministry. He brought Dan and Heidi Bonarotti, these two physical therapists who wanted to do service projects like Grace Village. He brought Ryan Pryor, a young guy to lead worship. Brought a woman in her 70s named Gay Pollock to run our attendance table. He brought a guy named Doug Wilson, a 30-something lead mechanic at Hacienda Shell in Scotts Valley to wrestle around with the kids. He brought Matt Tozier, critical care nurse from Dominican Hospital. He brought my dad, Doug Seitz, who had no youth ministry experience. And my dad's job, bring food for the leaders' meetings. And that's what he did every single week. He brought Jeremy Chin, a UCSC student who's become a lifelong friend. In fact, I'm going to officiate at his wedding in September. He's <laughs> waited all these years to get married. And what I realized is that by decreasing, I increased. Or Jesus did. His kingdom increased. I realized, you know what? All that I was doing was trying to win the bride's attention to me. That's not the goal. The goal is to get the attention of the bride of Christ, the people of God, and prospective members of God's people directed to him. And even last week in our elders meeting, Richard gave a devotion, and that was one of the big points. What if we were to be people known as those who consistently point others' attention to Jesus Christ? Well, this was a hard lesson for me to learn, but wow, it was a wonderful lesson. John 12, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And then just two weeks ago, Becky and I were in Capitola and we ran into Melissa Kenny. We haven't seen Melissa in a lot of years because, you know, life just takes you in different directions. And we were just, we just hugged and we're so happy to see her. And she just reiterated there, right there on the Esplanade, Becky and you, you guys made such a big difference. Just inviting me into ministry, setting me loose with these students. I didn't think I had that capacity. And wow, God really used that in my life to launch me into some kingdom work. Natural or next envy crusher relates naturally. My happiness consists in a more united bride and groom. That's where our satisfaction and identity should be wrapped in. And how we measure our success is in a hep- happily ever after Jesus and his people. Whatever we can do to further that, even if people don't think we're all that much or don't think about us at all. If what we said or done somehow points people a little more in the direction of the bridegroom Jesus, we've done our job. Last thing is this. My contraction and his expansion is a necessity. That's what John says. He must increase, but I must decrease. This too is just a fascinating verse because of the easily overlooked word must. This word indicates in a very strong way divine necessity. And it's interesting to do a word search and look at other places in the gospel of John where this phrase is used. Like, it is necessary for the Son of God to suffer. It is necessary for the Son of God to be raised. This is divine necessity. And what John is saying is that it's necessary for me to decrease. And I think the takeaway for us in this is that we are all ultimately going to decrease anyway, right? So what if our task was never to seek increasing, whether followers on Instagram or something at work, all we thought about is, I'm going to advance the people around me. I'm going to pour into them. I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to look for ways to help them move forward in my corporate job or in my ministry role. I'm not going to guard it for myself. I'm going to look for ways to develop, 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 and push other people forward. That's how I measure success. 
Let me just share this as we um, kind of wrap it up here. This is, you might know, Mission San Juan Batista, right? Beautiful, beautiful place. And I've been there many times, and I've always really been taken by the, the bronze John the Baptist statue and just thinking about him raising his hands up to heaven in prayer. And as I was studying this week, I thought, you know what? I think I've misinterpreted this statue. He's not raising his hands in prayer. He's throwing up his hands in exasperation. Why did you name a church after me? That'd be like the last thing John would ever want. He said, you named it after me. Do I need to recite to you John 3 again? Name it after Jesus. And I think we can learn from that. We can say, you know what? It's not about me. It's about whatever I can do in big and little ways to point people towards him. As John says, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. It's not bad to come from the earth. It's just not like coming from heaven. He who comes from heaven is above all. Let me uh, share a little application here. And this is uh, thanks to Christina Allen's wonderful graphics work here. Um, you know, we're passionate around here about the idea of path. The spiritual life is not an event. It's a venture over time. It's a road, all that New Testament and Old Testament imagery of pathway. Well, as we go along the path of life, we're going to hit spots where we're going to easily fall into envy traps. It's just going to be right in front of us on the road. And so picture yourself like that blue striped guy in the bottom left quarter. You're going to come across people whose success or ability or looks or possessions or accomplishments, whatever, is just shining. And it makes you feel like you're sinking into feelings of sadness and dissatisfaction. What do you do? What do you do when you come across that person you live with or work with or study with or you're on a sports team with? These are spiritually significant moments for faithers like us. Well, here's the first option. You can slide right down the envy slide. This is just going with spiritual gravity. This doesn't take any effort whatsoever. And it starts with a thought when envy is on offer. It's a proposition and temptation itself is in sin. But when we give ourselves over to it, we say, I'm going to just feed this, and I'm going to let this simmer in me. Well, already we're starting to slide. And once we start to slide, boy, it's hard to go back up that slide. And then we find ourselves planning some retaliation. Uh, maybe it's just ostracizing the person or speaking a little bit behind their back or whatnot. And just like a children's slide, at first it's fun. You feel the wind blowing through your hair and so on. And wow, this feels good. And then you act out. We act out some retaliation. And then we hit the ground. And then the misery and grief hits the ground right next to us. And we just think, oh, just like Emily Flake wrote, I, I just know I'm lesser than I should be. I'm dishonoring God. I'm off the path. And we feel like Proverbs 14.30 says that, that how envy rots the bones. And you just feel that deep within. But there's another way. There's another choice that we can make if we're believers in Jesus Christ. And this is unnatural, but believers are unnatural. We're supernatural people now. We have God's spirit inside of us. And that's to climb up the mercy ladder instead. And here's what we do. Number one is we turn immediately to our good shepherd and we're honest with him about our feelings. You tell him, I'm feeling bad in comparison to this other person. And you cast your care upon him because he cares for you. You tell him you're feeling bad and inadequate compared to this other person. And you tell him, God, I want to be grateful. And I don't want to slip down the envy slide. And then you talk truth to yourself. That's next. You say, this isn't a limited good situation. I've been blessed richly by a God, and I'm going to be blessed richly in the future. And you thank God for what he's given you. And you talk to your soul like the psalmist did. You tell yourself, I'm of great worth. I'm his adopted child. And you even tell yourself too, there's plenty for me in this life and plenty for me in the life to come. As 1 Corinthians 3 says, very strangely, all things are mine. Don't know what to do with that exactly, but I know it's amazing. Next, pray right away for additional blessing for that person. 
Say, Lord, whatever you've done for her or him in the past, double it, triple it, quadruple it. Extend that person's influence. Bless him or her. Pray for God's very best in their life. And then finally, rung number four, help or affirm the person. And I really like this one. This is where the mercy ladder gets its name, doing something positive for that person. Because the word for mercy in the Bible isn't just an attitude. It's related to the word for alms, like giving an actual gift. So combine, go up with a giving action, which God always sees and is always remembered by God. And you might say, well, wait a minute, it doesn't make sense because alms are for the poor, and this person seems to have it all. Well, maybe, but everybody is carrying around their aches and their pains and their disappointments and their insecurities. You know, as Kelsey Ballerini sings, even the homecoming queen cries. And it's true. And we don't know what's in store for these people, so pray for them, affirm, support, give them something. And then the last rung on the ladder is this. It's to enjoy the peace and the freedom. Again, Proverbs 14, 30, that envy rots the bones, but a tranquil heart is life to the fleshes. It's life for your entire being, your entire self. Let's pray, and then the band's going to come up, and we're going to sing a really interesting song that really gets at this. These first two songs were excellent too and really zeroing our attention on Jesus. And this last song would do it. And then Pastor Andy's going to come up and uh, have a wonderful interview with Jared and Sharon. So uh, it's the band around here somewhere. Here they are. Let me pray and then we'll, 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 we'll respond in musical praise. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the wisdom from your scripture, from John the Baptist. We thank you, Lord, for what a timely speech his is for us today and for those we know, Lord, who are just in the grip of envy and comparison and competition and are getting sick to the roots of their souls and bodies as a result. Help us to flip that on its head. Help us to affirm and to help and to, to look to advance other people, to look to decrease and let others increase. Show us how to do that. Help us to be like that little grain of wheat that falls into the earth and dies, but bears great fruit. Empower us this week for that mission. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus the King. Amen.